και πρέπον και επενετώ είναι το χρέος μου αυτό διά διά να επενέσω επενούς να αποδώσω Στον χαρακτήρα των σεπτών κι στον αρχιερατικό εις τον δεσπότην λέγω αξιών των αξιών των επένων Αυτός είναι ο αρχιερεύς και τον καλόν ο παροχεύς τι μη αρχιερέων δόξα τον η δόξα τον is the center of the Divine Liturgy. It is the center of our lives as Christians. Every decision we make should be with the understanding that we need to take Holy Communion. Is that compatible with what I'm about to do? Yes. Hear us, O Lord Jesus Christ, our God, from thy holy dwelling place and from the throne of glory of thy kingdom. And come to sanctify us, O thou who sittest on high with the Father in our tear invisibly present with us and vouchsafe by thy mighty hand to impart unto us thine immaculate body and precious blood, and through us to all thy people. O God, be gracious unto me, a sinner, and have mercy upon me. O God, be gracious unto me, a sinner, and have mercy upon me. O God, be gracious unto me, a sinner, and have mercy upon me. Christ said to his disciples, I go to the Father, yet a little while, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me because I live, you will live also. The world refers to the people outside of the Divine Liturgy. He said to the disciples that they would still see him. Those who partake of Holy Communion will continue to see Christ and abide in him. They will have life. Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Christ is not seen by those who do not participate in Holy Communion. He is, however, present to those in the Divine Liturgy. At His Ascension, Christ promised that He would be with us until the end of time, and He has remained with us at the Liturgy. Just as His Divinity was invisibly present in His incarnate body, so is His Divinity invisibly present in the bread and wine. St. Cyril of Alexandria says, the holy bread is like a veil hiding the divinity within it. The prophet Elias, when he ascended to heaven, left his sheepskin cloak to his disciple and his sails. That was a type of Jesus ascending to heaven, yet leaving us his body on earth. Christ not only dwells among us, but through Holy Communion abides in us. When we consume the Holy Communion, we taste him who is worshipped by the angels and sits on the throne at the right hand of the Father. By Christ's hand, he gives himself to the priest and through the priest to all the people. The precious body of Christ is now elevated high above the priest's head for all to see, just as Jesus Christ was elevated on the cross for all creation to behold. The priest elevates the body of Christ for all the people to see. 
The priest proclaims an invitation, but also a warning. Let us attend the holy things are for the holy. The holy things mentioned here are the body and blood of Christ. The holy that they are for are the people of Christ. The people immediately respond, declaring that only one is holy, and that is Jesus Christ. We, the people of Christ, are not holy on our own, but become holy through our being part of the body of Christ and through regular participation in the partaking of his body and blood. St. Simeon of Thessaloniki explains that by the people declaring that one is holy, one is Lord, Jesus Christ, they are saying that it was the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, who took on human flesh, who is holy. With this understanding, we remember that our human nature was elevated, sanctified, made holy through the incarnation of Jesus Christ. No one achieves holiness on their own, but it was a gift from God. St. Nicholas Cavasilas explains that this mystery can be likened to putting out many mirrors which reflect the light of the sun. While it would appear that there are many suns, there is only one sun. Jesus' holiness is what glorifies the Father. God is glorified when we reflect His holiness. We become partakers of Christ's holiness when we participate in the Eucharistic table. Now, the priest physically prepares what he and the people are about to partake of in the Holy Chalice. Although what he is doing is practical, there are spiritual elements to his actions. The body of Christ is broken up into four segments and is placed on the discos in the form of a cross. The priest then places one of the four fragments in the chalice and then communes himself and the other clergy with the other piece and uses the last two pieces to commune all of the faithful. Divided and distributed is the Lamb of God who is divided yet not disunited, who is ever eaten yet never consumed, but sanctifieth those who partake thereof. Jesus Christos Nica. At the first divine liturgy celebrated by Christ and his disciples, Christ broke the bread into pieces and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Dividing the lamb into pieces reveals the slaughter of our Lord. Christ's legs were not broken on the cross, as the thieves had done to them, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. St. John Chrysostom explains that Christ now undergoes what he did not at the crucifixion, so that we may be fulfilled. As Luke and Cleopas recognized Christ after his resurrection, in the breaking of the bread, Christ also reveals himself to us in the breaking of the bread. Christ is broken in pieces, but he is not divided. Just as fire from an original source can light many other fires, and never be any less hot in the last place as it was in the first, so Christ's body is just as much Christ in his entirety in every particle of Holy Communion as it was in the entire Lamb. Christ is broken and distributed, but remains whole. 
Every person who receives Holy Communion receives Christ whole. Christ's body and blood are ever eaten, yet never consumed. He is inexhaustible. He is continually poured out to us. The celebrant now makes the sign of the cross with the IC portion of the lamb and places it in the chalice. The faithful do not receive communion from this piece, but it remains in the chalice until the priest or deacon consume the contents of the chalice after liturgy. The fullness of the Holy Spirit. Blessed is the warmth of thy saints, always, now, and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. The warmth of the Holy Spirit. When Christ's body is added to his blood in the chalice, it signifies that Christ is one. Bread sustains man, and wine brings him gladness. The body of Christ gives us strength, and his blood brings us joy. As Christ's body is put in the chalice, the priest says, the fullness of the Holy Spirit. This is because what we receive when we partake of Christ's body is the Holy Spirit. The hot water poured into the chalice is known as Zion. Right when Jesus died on the cross, a soldier pierced his side with a spear, and out came blood and water. The blood is in the chalice, and so now water is added. The water is hot so as to make his blood warm, just as it would have been after he had just died on the cross. Being warm is also a symbol of life. Things that are dead are cold, but the Lord's side produced life-giving blood and water, which represent communion and baptism, two life-giving mysteries. As the priest adds the zeon to the chalice, he says, the warmth of the Holy Spirit. The zeon, which is boiling water, is water, which is how Christ referred to the Holy Spirit. And it is hot to remind us also of the Holy Spirit, which came upon the apostles in the form of fiery tongues, and now comes to us. As we receive Holy Communion, we are partaking of spiritual fire. Preparation for Holy Communion is made all week long. The way we act, our relationships with each other, keeping the fast days, saying our prayers, but specifically the night before Divine Liturgy, we should have a quiet and sober evening filled with prayer. On the evening before Liturgy, there is a canon of preparation before Holy Communion that is read during Compline. The next morning, the pre-Communion prayers consist of three Psalms, three Troparia, and nine prayers written by various Holy Fathers. The pre-Communion prayers that are said in most parishes right before Communion are just the last few prayers in the series of preparatory prayers. The prayers of preparation for Holy Communion are very beautiful and should be said as often as possible before communion. They put us in the right frame of mind to contemplate our sinful nature and prepare us to partake of the flesh and blood of the Son of God. These prayers help us to understand the gravity of that which we are about to receive. The first prayer of the last set of prayers, which is said right before communion and begins, I believe, O Lord, and I confess that thou art truly the Christ, the Son of the living God, who didst come into the world to save sinners, of whom I am first, is a confession of faith and hope in Christ's love. This prayer is based on the words of the Apostle Paul in his first letter to Timothy. On this, St. John Chrysostom explains that Christ chose the greatest sinner, St. Paul, who used to persecute Christians and pardoned him his transgressions. St. Paul refers to himself here as the foremost of sinners. And so if Christ pardoned him, surely the rest of us can be forgiven our sins. Holy Communion is the actual body and blood of Christ. During Jesus' ministry, he healed many people, some through touch and others by saying to them, your sins are forgiven you. Our Lord's body and blood is the ultimate medicine for the healing of soul and body. It burns away our sins and transgressions. It has power to heal and therefore is never a means by which illness can be transmitted. 
After the priest eats the body and then drinks the blood of Christ, he kisses the chalice, wipes his mouth in the chalice with the kalima, and says, Lo, this hath touched my lips, and shall take away mine iniquities, and purge away my sins. The book of Isaiah contains a mystical experience as he was called to be a prophet of God, where one of the seraphim placed a burning coal on Isaiah's lips using tongs. After the burning coal had touched Isaiah's lips, an angel said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your iniquity is taken away, and your sin purged. This was a prefiguring of Holy Communion, which takes away our iniquity and purges our sin. Holy Communion is perceived as simply bread and wine to those who do not have the spiritual clarity to see that it is the food of immortality. God created the heavens and the earth in six days and rested on the seventh. The seventh day of rest was a foreshadowing of God lying dead in the tomb. The next day, the day of resurrection, was the first day of the week, but mystically the eighth day. It is the never-ending day that we now live in, and the resurrection is constantly being celebrated. As the priest and or deacon break the pieces of Christ's body and place them into the chalice, they recite these Paschal hymns that we have beheld the resurrection of Christ, let us worship the Holy Lord Jesus, the only sinless one. Thy cross do we adore, O Christ, and thy holy resurrection we praise and glorify. For thou art our God, we know none other beside thee, we call upon thy name. O come, all ye faithful, let us adore Christ's holy resurrection. For lo, through the cross is joy come to all the world. Ever blessing the Lord, let us sing his resurrection. For in that he enjoyed the cross for us, he hath destroyed death by death. Shine, shine, O new Jerusalem, for the glory of the Lord hath dawned upon thee. Dance and be glad, O Zion, and delight thou, O pure Theotokos, in the arising of thy Son. How divine, how beloved, how sweet is thy voice, O Christ, for thou hast faithfully promised to be with us to the end of the age. Having this as our anchor of hope, we, the faithful, do rejoice. O Christ, great and most holy Pascha, O wisdom, word, and power of God, grant that we may more perfectly partake of thee in the never-ending day of thy kingdom. We had seen the resurrection of Christ celebrated earlier during the Divine Liturgy, but now, through partaking of Holy Communion, we experience it firsthand. Every Divine Liturgy is a celebration of the resurrection of our Lord, and every time the faithful partake of Holy Communion, it is a personal resurrection to Him who partakes of the body and blood of Christ. Our mortal souls are only made immortal when we intermingle with the resurrected Lord who is immortal. So the first thing I wanted to go over was that we are not a part of the world, as uh, we heard in the video. Um, the world is all the people who are outside of the divine liturgy. Um, because the Lord said that we are able to see him and we will be able to continue to see him. So who did he speak to? He spoke to the apostles. And of course, who are the successors to the apostles? They're the bishops. And uh, the priests are ordained to go in place of the bishop. And so if we can see him, we bring him to you, the people. And so that makes um, us who are inside the liturgy able to see him physically, right? Because the only way that we physically see the Lord the way that he didn't leave us is through his body and blood. His body and blood is, is him, right? So we see the Lord in his body and blood in the liturgy. And so those outside in the world can't see him. And so it's so important to come to liturgy. It's the only place where we can really see God. You know, people are always saying, why can't I see God? Why doesn't he show himself to me? Well, he does. But you have to come to the right place. You have to come to the divine liturgy where he's at and see him. And that's why it's so important to come to church. And St. Cyril of Alexandria says that the holy bread is like a veil which covers the divinity of Christ. So people in the first century when Christ was alive, they would have um, seen him and said, that's not God, it's just a person, right? Right? And it wasn't until later that it was slowly revealed um, that he was God. And some people knew he was, but some didn't. And so 
his body, his physical body, his incarnate body, veiled his divinity, right? What if he just came as like a big cloud or something like that? Then everyone would know that it was God, but that's not how he wanted it. It was veiled. And God, you know, this idea of veiling God, God needs to be veiled because we can't look at him unless we're worthy to look at him. He tells Moses even um, on, the, uh, on, the, on Mount Sinai that if he saw his face that he would die because we weren't ready to see God yet. And so what happened was Christ's divinity was veiled in his body and the same way in Holy Communion, his um, divinity is veiled within the bread and the wine. It still looks like bread, smells like bread, tastes like bread, same with the wine. But his divinity is in there and it's masked in there. So that those who are not spiritual, who don't have spiritual eyes to see, um, they will only see bread and wine. But it's for us, the Christians, who know better, who know that that's his body and blood. And it's his actual body and blood. It's not a symbol. It's not fake. It's not just done in remembrance in the sense that we remember it as a memory. No, we're actually partaking of it. And we'll talk about that a little more here in a minute. Um, but I want to tell you a story. There were these two young boys once um, who were playing liturgy. They were pretending to be priests. And so they um, got to the part of communion, and then they tasted the communion, you know, and of course they were just playing around. But it turned into human flesh and blood in their mouths. And they became so scared, an angel came and told them, what you're doing is real. Don't pretend like this. Don't play like this. One day you will really serve the church. And they were so afraid they never did it again. But both of those brothers became bishops in the future. So here's another amazing part about communion. And that is that Christ, when he ascended to heaven, 40 days after his resurrection, he ascended with his body and he went up to heaven, right? And so he's still here on earth with us. How is he on earth with us here? We said before, it's through Holy Communion. So when we partake of his body here on earth, and his body is up in heaven, we are actually somehow linked to heaven because we're eating his body which is in heaven here on earth. And so we are partaking of heaven. We are, we, a part of us is in heaven, right? And so the church here, this church building is the embassy of heaven to earth. You know, so like the law says that if you go to the Russian embassy here in the United States, as soon as you step in that embassy, you are in Russia legally, right? Even though you're still on the soil technically of the United States, once you step in that embassy, you're on Russian soil. So here in the church, you're in heaven's embassy on earth, all right? There are even laws in our country that protect people who take refuge in a church, that you won't come in here and get arrested because you're taking sanctuary in the church. Even the armed forces ha has that law. So the church is very much seen as the embassy of heaven here on earth. So we are literally, even our government recognizes, recognizes that this is um, heaven while we're standing here. And so we're coming here, we're partaking of the heavenly and being linked to heaven very much when we come to liturgy. Another great reason to come, to never miss liturgy. In John 17, 16, we are told that we are in the world, but not of the world. And so we are citizens of heaven. You know, we don't even have a dual citizenship. We have one citizenship, and that's in heaven. And that's why whatever happens on earth, you know, the Christians weren't so worried about the Roman Empire and the early Christian church. Whatever's happening here in, in our society and wars and all that, we go beyond that. We don't let that take away our peace even because we are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And so we have to act in a way that we are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. We eat heavenly food, right? So we're here temporarily on earth. We're not saying that earth is bad because God created it for us. He created the world and all creation for us. But we have something more important. We have something better. So when life isn't fair, you hear that all the time, life isn't fair, we heard that as children all the time, right? We have to know that life is not fair, but after life is fair. And so if we suffer here, it will be made up to us over there, just like we heard in the story 
uh, that Christ told of the rich man and Lazarus. So St. John Chrysostom says, Above I have you, and below I intermingle with you. So it's amazing, again, this idea that Christ is in heaven, but we are partaking of that heavenly Christ even while we're here on earth. So above, Christ is in the bosom of God the Father. Below, He's in the bosom of the church, our mother. I want to uh, go back and talk about when the priest elevates the lamb and says, let us attend, the holy things are for the holy. Now in Greek it's ta aigia tis aigis, which means the holy things, the body and blood of Christ, are for the holy people of God. The people of God is implied, the holy people of God. And so we are saying right after that that one is holy, one is Lord, Jesus Christ. So if Jesus Christ is holy, that would mean, and He's the only one that's holy, so that would mean that we are not holy. But we're saying that the holy things are for the holy people of God. So what does this mean? Communion is not for those who are perfect. It's not for those who have attained perfection, like some of the saints of the church, like Anthony the Great is a good example, or John the Baptist. It's not just for them, it's, it's for them as well, but it's also for those who are struggling to attain perfection. And that's why there are certain sins that when somebody's living in that sin and refuses to denounce those sins and to say, yes, I'm being sinful, I'm trying to change, if they're continuing to live in that sin, then the church through the priest would say, you're not able to take communion because you're not repenting. You are uh, not admitting that what you're doing is wrong. But if you are a struggling Christian, right? It said, Jesus said, I didn't come to save the righteous, but sinners. I, call, I came to call the sinners to repentance, right? So communion, you don't have to be perfect to take Holy Communion, but you do have to be trying and really trying. So to be holy is not just to rid oneself of sin, but to acquire the Holy Spirit. St. John Chrysostom says that the priest is not just calling at this point the righteous, the saints, to communion um, and, and those who are struggling, but also he is warning people. He's telling the unworthy, do not approach. And so, how do we determine if we are holy or not? Or if we're worthy? Nobody's holy, first of all. Um, the word saint in Greek, is agios. So, Saint Nectarios, for example, would be known as agios nectarios. And the word for holy, like when we say holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, we say agios o theos. So the word for holy is the same word for saint. Um, and it's the same in Arabic. It doesn't uh, work out um, in English that um, same way. But the idea is that to be uh, holy is to be separated for God. Um, and so how should we determine if we should take communion, if we're worthy to take communion? Again, nobody is worthy to take communion on their own. It's through God's grace, but He died for us so that we can take communion, and He wants us to take communion so that we can acquire the Holy Spirit and become holy. So what does that mean for us? Um, should we take communion or should we not take communion? Some people take communion once a year. Some people take it every week. What's the right thing to do? The right thing to do is for each person to speak to their spiritual father and say, how often should I go to communion? How often should I come to confession? Should I commune every week? Should I commune once a year, once a month, on the major feast days? So that's a conversation between you and your spiritual father. And ideally, you should commune as often as possible. But that also means putting in the work. You have to put in the work to take communion. You have to prepare yourself. And we talked a little bit earlier in the video about uh, preparation. And we're going to teach a little bit more. We're going to talk a little more about preparation here in a little bit. But before I do that, I wanted to 
uh, share some advice given by the apostles. You know, the apostles uh, wrote a book called the Didache. And the Didache comes from the word for 12. Um, they say, if any is holy, let him come. And if any is not, let him repent. Maranatha, which means the Lord is coming. So the apostles are saying that if you are holy, if you have prepared yourself worthily, then approach communion, right? When the priest comes out, and we'll talk about this more uh, next class, uh, but he says, with the fear of God, with faith and love, draw near. Right? So there are conditions to drawing near. And uh, so if you are not worthy, repent. And when you repent, then you can come. But again, this, this has to be done with your priest. You can't decide on your own. Nobody should decide on their own. I don't decide on my own. As a priest, I have a spiritual father that I go to, and he instructs me as to what to do. Another beautiful image is that bread sustains us. It gives us life. It fills us, right? And according to Psalm 103, it says, wine gladdens the heart of man. So you have bread and wine, the earthly substances that sustain us and make us cheerful or joyful. So how much more when that bread and wine turn into the body and blood of Jesus Christ, how much more does it sustain us? And how much more does it make us joyful? Does it fill our heart with joy and cheer? And so Holy Communion is the fulfillment of the Old Testament manna that rained down from heaven, right? You remember in the book of Exodus, as the uh, Israelites are leaving Egypt, they were starving. God rains manna down from heaven. And by the way, remember the manna was kept in the Ark of the Covenant in the Golden Tabernacle. Now in the altar, we have in the Golden Tabernacle, um, or the tabernacle made of, uh, of precious metal, we have um, the body and blood of Christ, which is the fulfillment of the manna. So the manna sustained their bodies. Now the body and blood, the new manna, um, sustain our souls. And of course, Christ says himself that unless you eat the body and drink the blood of the Son of Man, you have no life in you. So it's very necessary. In order to have life, we need to eat the spiritual food which gives us eternal life, not just temporal life. And you saw in the video where the priest took the hot water called Zeon in Greek, uh, and he poured it into the chalice, and you saw the steam rising up, right? So when the clergy and the people receive Holy Communion, it should be hot, not lukewarm or cold, so that we understand that what we are receiving is warm just as it came out of Christ's side. You know, you see that icon of Christ with the blood and the water coming out. It's almost like we're standing there opening our mouth and it's coming right into our mouth, that life-saving blood of Christ. So we take it and it's warm as if it's alive still because it is, it's living blood. And so that warmth reminds us of that. So going back to this preparation of Holy Communion, uh, there are prayer books that you can buy that have the full service. If but we say a number of prayers of preparation. So first of all, like you heard earlier, we're preparing the whole week for Holy Communion. Holy Communion is the center of our life. It should be the very center of our week. Everything we do should be in preparation to receive the body and blood of Christ. So what do we do immediately before? The night before, we read small compline and... At a certain point in the compline service, it says if you want to add a canon, you do it here. And then you read the canon of preparation for Holy Communion. And you go through their nine odes, minus one, the second ode is taken out. So you have um, the eight odes, really, to read through. And then you go back and finish compline up. The next morning, you wake up just a little early. And uh, you can uh, say the rest of the prayers. So there are three psalms, three traparia, and nine prayers that you would say um, while you're preparing from home that morning. Now, I know some people, it's hard for them to wake up even earlier. It's a struggle for a lot of people to even get here to church on time. If you need to, talk to your spiritual father. I would tell my spiritual children, it's better to do those prayers the night before than not to do them at all. Also, if, you know, this is kind of a last alternative, 
um, the Hermitage of the Holy Cross here in West Virginia uh, has a CD, and I believe they have pre-communion prayers recorded on the CD. So if you need to um, listen to the, um, the CD to get your pre-communion prayers on your way to church, that would even be better than nothing at all. But the best thing is for you to wake up a little early and prepare yourself by reading those prayers. We actually, in our church here, have somebody read the prayers early before Orthros even starts, about 9 o'clock in the morning. So if you ever want to join that, you can come here at 9 o'clock and listen to the pre-communion prayers. It would be a good way for you to prepare yourself um, for Holy Communion. And then right before Holy Communion, we have those prayers that we say. In some churches, they have even more than those um, three prayers that we do. Um, But the one prayer, I believe... O oh Lord, and I confess that Thou art truly the Christ, the Son of the living God, who didst come into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief, or who I am first. When we say that, we have to really, really believe it. We have to believe I am the chief among sinners, nobody else. So what does that mean for us? That means we shouldn't be looking around the church and saying, oh, yep, that's a chief sinner right there, and that's another one. No, we have to look at ourselves and say, I am the chief among sinners, and we have to believe it. We're not just paying lip service to the Lord. We have to believe that I am the worst among sinners. And when you do that, you will no longer judge anyone else. We will only be focusing on our own sins, because I am the worst sinner. So who am I to judge anyone else? Let's take the log out of our eye before the splinter in our neighbor's eye. So I want to talk about that beautiful vision um, and that mystical experience that Isaiah Um, encountered in the sixth chapter, verse 7, where the seraphim picked up a coal in tongs, using tongs, and uh, placed it on Isaiah's lips. So, of course, this is a type and a foreshadowing of Holy Communion. But the coal that was um, being used, you know, we think of like a black piece of coal. What they were referring to back then would have been a piece of wood. So you know how if you have a wood fire, there are smoldering pieces in there, even after you take it, Um, out of the fire, it's still smoldering. So that's what it was referring to as a piece of wood. So according to St. Cyril of Alexandria, although the coal has the nature of wood, it was in the fire and now has the power and efficacy of fire, just as Jesus Christ, who although he became and appeared human like us, he had still the whole fullness of the Godhead dwelling within him. So he might have had the nature of wood, but still has that full Godhead, and the same with the Holy Communion. It is a burning coal, and the pre-communion prayers talk about it being a burning coal. They get that from the book of Isaiah. And although it has the natures of bread and wine, it has the full power of the Godhead in that bread and wine. Also notice that the seraphim did not touch that coal with his hand. Because what happens when you touch coal? You get burned, a hot piece of coal, right? So he didn't touch it with his hand, but he used tongs. However, the priest today takes Christ directly in his hands, on his lips, and into him, right? And he gives it to the people to partake of. So look how much God loves mankind. The seraphim one of the highest ranks of angels, did not even dare to touch Christ, the Master. But look how much He loves us. And He shows us also the grace of the priesthood. God loves us so much that He gave us the priesthood as a gift. So look at the priest can do what the angels can't do. And that's an amazing thing. It really shows us the love that God has for us. We had a question as to At what point of the liturgy, if we walk in late, at what point should we not receive Holy Communion anymore? That's a great question. So you see people kind of coming in all through liturgy, and that's not a good practice. You know, we say, at least in my church here, that liturgy begins at 1030. If you're not here, at least, and and usually liturgy doesn't even start by that. It starts later, uh, because we're waiting for Orthros to finish. So if you can't even make it, to uh, the beginning of liturgy, that's not good because the preparation for Holy Communion, it really begins the evening before. You should come to Vespers the evening before, come to Orthros that morning because that's all part of the same service. It's all for the resurrection. 
and then stay for liturgy the entire time. But one step at a time. I'm not going to say you should never take communion if you're not at Vespers and Orthros and liturgy. Uh, that's the ideal. That's the best thing to do. But at the very least, be at the beginning of liturgy. When the priest says, blesses is the kingdom and raises up the gospel, makes a sign over the Antimension, we're really transporting from earth to heaven. And we should be there for that. You can't miss that train, right? We have to be here uh, at the beginning of liturgy. If you're not here for the beginning of liturgy, it's not respectful to come take Holy Communion. Now, if you're getting to church late, please still come. If you had a valid excuse, you did your very best to be here, I can understand, but please don't walk in right before communion, walk straight to the communion line. I know uh, of parishes where people would do that. They would come right in to church, right at communion, come take communion, and then leave. We're going to talk uh, next time more about after communion, but taking uh, communion and then leaving early is equivalent to the kiss of Judas, according to St. John Chrysostom. That's a strong statement. Because that's what Judas did. He took communion and then left and ended up betraying Christ. So we don't want to do that. You know, um, in a parish that I would visit sometimes, um, they did not have the habit of having orthros in the morning. They would have vespers in uh, the evening the night before, and then they had liturgy the next morning. And so for me, it was so strange to not go to orthros that I even felt weird approaching the chalice a divine liturgy, even though I went to all the services offered, but I felt funny not ha having gone to Orthros. So you really want to take it seriously. We always want to up our spiritual lives. Whatever we're doing now, let's do better next time. So that's everything we have for today. Thank you very much for watching. God bless you, and we'll see you next time.